Um, I, on behalf of I'm I'm uh, Daniel Elam, and on behalf of me and uh, Dr. Alvin Wong, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Center for the Study of Globalization and its Cultures uh, lecture series that we're having over the course of the semester. Uh, this is one of many conversations that we're kind of having Monday evenings, more or less, uh, uh, that uh, the, the center is putting on, and uh, we kind of are looking forward to having you join our conversation as it goes on. The Center for the Study of Globalization and its Cultures was set up in 1999 under the joint directorship of Professor Akbar Abbas and Benjamin Lee, and is an interdisciplinary center based within the Department of Comparative Literature at the University of Hong Kong. So the focus of our work here is on issues of culture and globalization with a special reference to Asia, uh, China, and Hong Kong. And our research themes, among many others, include cultures of, uh, cultures of capitalization, sorry, capitalism, <laughs> capitalism and globalization, global flows of culture, media and technology, cities and globalization, and new communities, publics, identities, and postcolonialism, decoloniality, and neoliberalism. Uh, and I wanted, to, before I can hand it over to uh, Professor Dr. Beth Harper, I wanted to mention really briefly the some upcoming events that we're also having and kind of participating in or hosting or co-hosting. The next one is on Friday. Uh, it's with Professor Nicole Huang, and it's uh, celebrating her book uh, on Eileen Chung at the University of Hong Kong. Her, her book release, uh, and that will be uh, in, uh, in both hybrid and in person, sorry, uh, in English, and it will be in the multipurpose area in the main library and over Zoom. And you can visit our website, uh, csgchku.wordpress.com for more details and how to register. And there's, you can also, while you're there, you'll find out many, many other of the other events that we're having throughout the semester. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Harper. Thank you very much for joining us. Great, thanks, Daniel. Um, so I'm Beth Harper. I'm an assistant professor here in Comparative Literature at HKU. And um, it's my great honor and pleasure to have with us today, uh, Lucas Rambo Bender who um, is assistant professor of Chinese literature in the Department of East Asian Studies, um, oh, sorry, East Asian Languages and Literatures um, at Yale University. He's recently published a monograph on Dufu called Dufu Transforms, and he's now working on medieval Chinese front frontier poetry and on the legacy of so-called um, obscure learning, Xuanxue. So it's, it was really fortuitous um, that I was able to um, invite uh, Lucas to speak with us today. I was in, I was in uh, New Haven this summer reading actually an article by um, Professor Bender. And I thought, oh, I wonder if he's around on campus. Um, so we actually had a conversation about, uh, which tied into many of the threads from this very rich, complex um, book. Um, and this talk is the kind of resultant um, um, fruit of that of, of that encounter. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that, that Professor Bender is here to talk through some of the key themes. And I think this is a book that really speaks to um, not just sort of Dufu as one Chinese poet, but really a kind of general, um, theoretically complex book on what Chinese poetry is, how it's developed through the ages, um, and how we can really think about um, a specific pre-modern Chinese poet in a more, um, in a larger nexus of what is comparative literature. So I'm really happy to um, pass over now to Professor Bender. Okay, um, let me try sharing my screen and uh, you guys can tell me if it's if it's all there. Looks good. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, let, let me just start by saying thank you um, for inviting me. Uh, Specifically, thanks to uh, Professors Elam and Wong, and especially thanks to uh, Professor Harper um, for this really generous invitation to discuss my book. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation, uh, partly because, you know, through COVID, um, it, I kind of haven't had the opportunity to talk with people about it so much. So, um, uh, you know, please, uh, let me know what you think about the the talk, and and um, I'm kind of looking forward to hearing people's opinions and where else it could go. So the book is kind of trying to do a couple of different things for a couple of different audiences, and I'm going to focus today on uh, the way that I hope it might hold some interest for uh, specifically a comparative literature audience that isn't really uh, focused um, specifically on Tang poetry. Um, so uh, to, to do this, I need to, let's see, change my slide. Yeah, I need to give a little bit of background on the way that Tang poetry has often been discussed in English. Um, and as many people here today will certainly know, 
Um, Chinese poetry has since the 1980s often been treated as presenting a, a really marked contrast to Western literature writ large. Western literature um, you know, is often taken in these comparisons as being founded on a theory of fictionality, poetry as poesis, creation of something new, fictional. Um, whereas Chinese poetry is supposedly uh, non-fictional. Thus, where the Western poet uh, supposedly produces a parable that points to some sort of truth beyond the world of history, the Chinese poet supposedly just records what he or she witnesses, experiences, and feels in the course of this world's history. Um, so, those Western critics who have sort of pushed this contrast have given a number of justifications for it, uh, including some issues of comparative metaphysics uh, that I've discussed elsewhere, but I'm going to pass over for the moment, and um, I'll be happy to come back to them in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, but the starting point for my book is really the way that this vision of Chinese poetry as non-fictional uh, actually picks up certain threads from emic Chinese poetic discourse, specifically from the late imperial and modern periods. Um, this vision in particular echoes discussions of Du Fu, who is often taken as the greatest classical Chinese poet and who has since the Song Dynasty been called uh, the poet historian for the way his work tracks his experience of the Tang's collapse to the Anlushan Rebellion. Now, over the last thousand years, this understanding of Du Fu's work, Du Fu as poet historian writing out his experiences, um, has become more or less unavoidable because it's been written into the very collection that most people read. Uh, by Dufu's critics and publishers uh, who have organized the collection in chronological order. They have accompanied most editions of the collection with Nianpu, which are year charts detailing which poems he wrote when and what was going on at the time, um, and provided the collection with uh, really extensive, huge, historically informative commentaries linking each one of his 1400 poems to a particular historical moment. Over time, um, anyone who reads pre-modern Chinese poetry will know, each of these types of paratexts has become common or even standard uh, in the presentation of the work of most great pre-modern Chinese poets, even those from before Du Fu's time. And we, expect now as readers of pre-modern Chinese poetry that the editions we read are going to reconstruct for us whenever possible when each poem was written and what the historical circumstances were. Um, now, my research though really began from the recognition that in fact, none of these sorts of paratextual aids of, to reading existed in Du Fu's own time. Dufu was, in fact, the first poet for whom editors arranged his poetry in chronological order. He was the first poet that scholars produced a Nianpu year chart for. And he was the first poet whose collection was ever, as far as we can tell, accompanied with truly historically informative commentary. What this means, I think, is that um, Dufu could not have expected that his work would be read in anything like the way it's read today, since no poetry in his time was accompanied by this sort of historically contextualizing apparatus. Um, and, and once you kind of recognize this, this difference between the reading culture of Dufu's time and the reading culture that we're used to now, the question becomes, how was poetry read and understood in Dufu's time? And what was uh, Du Fu doing in particular that was different enough from his contemporaries to invite the invention of these new genres and criticism and these new modes of understanding uh, 
um, that originally centered around his collection specifically. Okay, so those are the kind of basic questions of the book. Um, and I'd say, you know, about a third of the work of the book involves trying to reconstruct aspects of poetic understanding in Dufu's time um, and to contrast those aspects with the way that Dufu has been read from the Song Dynasty to the present day. Um, and, you know, I'm going to try extremely briefly to summarize the contrast that I see here. Um, since it's kind of necessary for understanding the part that I really want to talk about more today, uh, which is focused on Dufu's poetry itself, uh, and which I think, I, you know, hope will be more interesting from a conflict perspective. Um, so really briefly, I suggest that Dufu has often been read through what I call in the book a recordizing paradigm. Um, now, this is an admittedly not very pretty neologism, uh, but what I mean by it is that critics have often seen Dufu's poetry as a record of his experience, feeling, and thought. To read Dufu's poetry under this kind of vision of what poetry is, is in some sense to vicariously re-experience his life in history. Um, and that suggests that whatever meaning or significance is to be found in Dufu's poetry is not finally a matter of the poetry's language itself or what the language um, creates. Instead, language is merely kind of a gateway to a meaning or significance that was there in the world at the moment that Dufu wrote the poem. So that meaning or significance is fundamentally historical, pertaining to the events that were underway at the time that Dufu was writing and the way that Dufu perceived them, thought about them, and felt about them. So all of Dufu's craftsmanship, all of his illusions, um, you know, all of the kind of beauty of the language, to, cer to a certain degree, um, these are all ultimately supposed to be transparent. They give us access to uh, that historical mo moment, that historical kind of movement of his consciousness. So uh, if Dufu's poetry is valuable under this vision of what poetry is, and of course, most critics have thought that his poetry is valuable and that in fact, it is kind of supremely valuable among, uh, among the works of Chinese poetry. Um, so if this poetry is valuable, it's because there's something, there was at that moment, something particularly valuable in the way that Dufu's consciousness moved, particularly the accuracy of his perceptions and the moral quality of his feelings. Um, and, and this kind of accuracy and morality uh, combined to earn him the title poet sage. Now, um, the recordizing paradigm, uh, you know, the main, the main contrast that I want to draw is that this, this recordizing paradigm was not part of the understanding of poetry in Dufu's time. So poetry was not justified by its accuracy to the shifting vicissitudes of history. Instead, it was much more commonly seen as a space wherein normative form um, could be imposed upon the vicissitudes of history. So poetry presented a kind of a space wherein poets could demonstrate the degree to which they had internalized the teachings of the cultural tradition, um, often in Dufu's time, uh, you know, kind of given in shorthand as Siwen, the thing that was there with Confucius, uh, this culture of ours in Peter Bowles um, influential translation. So from the early Tang onwards, um, this cultural tradition, Siwen, was often understood by uh, particularly literati as deriving from the ancient uh, sages of China who had encoded within this cultural tradition, 
the essential teachings necessary for maintaining a flourishing empire and a moral life. Um, by writing poetry that conformed to this cultural tradition through imitating or developing its normative forms, adopting or adapting its normative poses, and connecting or comparing one's own experiences to its normative examples, a poet could demonstrate his or her worthiness um, to participate in government and could contribute to the cultural flourishing of the empire and the political flourishing that would supposedly follow from it. So kind of to summarize, where the recordizing paradigm saw significance as imminent to history, uh, late medieval readers in, in Dufu's own time would have seen meaning as something that could be kind of imposed onto history by the adept uh, who was kind of brilliant and steeped into the in the tradition. Poetry, therefore, was not really non-fictional in Dufu's time in the way that Dufu's own poetry would come to be understood by post-medieval critics. It was not a transparent record of uh, something historical, but rather a reshaping of experience or an insight um, into experience that would not be accessible to anyone who lacked the requisite talent or learning. Okay, so I think there are potentially interesting comparisons that could be drawn between this um, not non-fictional late medieval poetic paradigm and certain recent or contemporary literary theoretical ideas from the modern West. Um, and you know, if people want to stick around until the um, conversation afterwards, I, I'd be thrilled to discuss them. Um, but uh, actually my book uh, sort of doesn't go this direction, doesn't explore this as much as I might have liked to. Um, it's much more concerned with trying to figure out uh, how Dufu's poetry would have worked against the background provided by this late medieval understanding of the poetic art. So why was it that Dufu was not actually a very famous poet in his lifetime, or indeed uh, for the next like 300 years? Why was it that Dufu only became China's so-called greatest poet in the Song Dynasty at a moment of sort of major upheaval in Chinese thought when print had started to come on the scene and when new forms of critical paratext um, were being added to his collection to contextualize it in history. What was there, uh, the book wants to ask, in Dufu's poetry itself that lent itself to this new recordizing paradigm? Um, and how did Dufu start writing poetry that was, in this sense, sort of before its time. So um, the book gives two sorts of answers to these questions, um, corresponding to two different meanings of the title, Dufu Transforms. So um, the first set of answers is actually uh, the bulk of the book, um, though I'm not going to cover it here today. Um, and this concerns the transformations of Dufu's poetry and poetic thought over the course of his life. So Dufu starts out, I think, a very conventional Haitong poet, maybe you could say even kind of hyper conventional, um, since he enacts the standard pieties of Tang poetry with a dedication and the sincerity that's marked um, among his contemporaries. Uh, but as he watches Tang society collapse to the Anlushan rebellion, he comes to doubt the most prominent ideas about poetry's moral and political significance that had justified the art in the preceding centuries and indeed uh, for him in his youth. Right. So um, as other poets kind of retrenched um, in conservative forms and conservative visions of poetry, in the immediate aftermath of the rebellion, 
Dufu instead begins to kind of experiment broadly, you might even say widely, uh, broad, wildly, um, with new visions of poetry and new conceptions of poetry's relationship to uh, important uh, topics of the day like ethics, politics, and tradition. And as a result, each period of Dufu's work has a kind of different set of animating questions. And, a, you know, I would say the bulk of the book is really devoted to close readings of poems from period to period, trying to highlight some of the changes that he goes through uh, and some of the logic of their sequence. Now, what I think might be more interesting for people who aren't particular fans of Dufu um, is the other argument I try to suggest in the title, Dufu Transforms. Um, now, this argument concerns the poetic vision that Dufu comes to near the end of his life. Put very briefly, uh, Dufu's disillusionment with the prevailing model of poetic significance in his own time leads him eventually to recognize that um, such models of meaning in general are fragile things, that they're prone to collapse, replacement, and transformation. So he stops, therefore, um, trying to kind of come up with a, a correct model of meaning, uh, a final understanding of what poetry is and why it matters. Um, and he stops, in fact, trying to understand completely uh, and to delimit fully what his own poetry means, or even what his life means. He comes instead to expect um, that readers, if he has any readers, and he doesn't know whether he will or won't, um, but he comes to expect that whatever readers he might have will see significance in his work and significance in his life that he himself can't see, um, that his work and his life will actually continue to transform as new ages and new communities of readers approach it with sort of different moral and aesthetic paradigms in mind. This is a hopeful possibility for Dufu since uh, by the standards of his age uh, and by his own standards in, in a lot of respects, he was really very, very clearly a failure. His life was not what he had hoped it would be, and he didn't accomplish the goals that he had set for himself. Yet, um, in his very late work, the possibility that there might be meaning in his suffering and his failure um, that he can't see from his present vantage point imparts uh, a kind of luminosity and hope to the poetry, um, despite the kind of, uh, you know, tragic circumstances that it describes. So um, I could, I, I think, you know, it would be possible to just stop here if we wanted to get straight to the conversation, but, um, you know, it, it might be useful, it might be interesting to um, flesh out these claims a little bit uh, through a discussion of some actual poetry of Dufu's. And um, to that end, I just like to offer a really quick reading of a very famous set of five poems called uh, Yonghuai Guji Wushou, which um, five poems singing my feelings on traces of the past, which some of you uh, will probably have encountered at some point in the past. Um, so just a bit of historical background, the kind of historical background that you know is now de rigueur in all discussions of Dufu's poetry. Um, when he wrote this series, uh, it was near the end of his life, and he'd long since abandoned the government career he would pursued really assiduously in his youth. He had fled from the war-torn capital region um, to the relatively more peaceful uh, far south, more peaceful, but, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, backwater far south. Um, and in each of these poems, uh, Dufu is considering the life and the works of some historical figure from the Southlands who also live a life of significant hardship 
exile, um, and in several cases, uh, failure. And what he finds with each of these figures is that if we look at their legacies, their failures, their sufferings, their exiles, all unexpectedly wind up important to communities that they themselves could not have imagined or foreseen from within the limited perspectives of their own lifetimes. So uh, Dufu makes this point most clearly in this first poem here, uh, which begins by describing his own experience of warfare and exile. Um, you know, I drifted more in the Southwest between the earth and sky. Um, and at, in the final uh, couplet kind of twists this description of his own experience um, by considering its similarity to the experience of the poet uh, Yusin. So uh, Yusin passed his youth in the southern state of Liang, but after the Liang fell uh, to the rebel uh, Ho Jing, who uh, Du Fu also kind of considered as a barbarian, just like he considered An Lushan a barbarian, um, Yuxin was then held captive in North China, where he wrote his famous uh, rhapsody, A Lament for the Southlands, um, which Du Fu says in the, in the final line of this poem, um, moved Jiang Guan. Uh, so this final phrase, Jiang Guan, uh, which uh, is, you know, sort of literally river passes is kind of a bit of a textual crux uh, and critics have debated what it meant, what it means. Um, but I'm personally most persuaded by those critics who have read it as a metonymy, both uh, the regions of the south around the Jiang River, that is the Yangtze River, and the regions of the north within the, pa within the Guan, the passes of Qin. So basically what Du Fu is saying here is that even though Yu Xin was lamenting his fallen Southern state from captivity under an enemy regime in the North, his poetry has actually moved readers both North and South. Indeed, throughout the entirety of the Tang Empire, which reconciled North and South into one larger polity. Um, and if Yu Xin's lament could speak to and maybe even contribute to the consolidation of a world whose reunification he, Yu Xin, could not foresee. Um, I think the suggestion is that Du Fu's poetry too may be able to contribute to a world whose current wounds may someday be healed. So, a similar point is also an issue in the second poem of the series, which considers the legendary Southern poet, uh, Song Yu. So Song Yu was supposedly a courtier during the reigns of King Huai and King Qingxiang of Chu, a large Southern state that was partly through their misgovernance on the decline and soon to be conquered by the Northern state of Qin. A pious readings of the works attributed to Song Yu um, in Du Fu's own time suggested that uh, Song Yu's literary writings were meant as <clears throat> remonstrations against uh, the, this misgovernance and as laments of Chu's decline. Yet these remonstrations um, and laments were ineffective. They uh, they didn't prevent uh, Chu from further decline. And within some 50 years, the state would be destroyed and the palaces that Song Yu was writing uh, in and about would be wiped from the map. Um, and Du Fu notes in the final lines here that uh, the state of Chu has by his time now been gone so long, even the locations of these palaces uh, are now uncertain. And yet, uh, because of Song Yu's writings, the boatmen of the region still take pride in pointing out the purported sites of these palaces, of, of the, the, the glories of the state of Chu, 
um, to visitors from the north, like Du Fu himself. In this sense, Song Yu's poetry provides a common point of reference, a common cultural heritage for people nowadays from the territories of both the once enemy states of Chu and of Qin. Okay, so um, just to do one more here quickly, the third poem of the series um, is gonna perform this same basic move again, uh, though this time I think it's even a kind of more daring way. Um, here, Du Fu is discussing uh, Wang Zhaojun, uh, Wang Zhaojun, sorry, uh, a southerner consort of Han Emperor Yuan, who was married off to the chief of the nomadic Xiongnu people. Um, now, Wang became a common topic of poetry uh, in the medieval tradition, and a very large number of poets um, wrote poems and songs in her voice, lamenting uh, the kind of cruelty of her fate, her exile to the bleak deserts of the Northwest, and the fact that she had to kind of live out her life among the barbarous Xiongnu. Now, most of this poetry is uh, xenophobic in the extreme, um, you know, it, it describes how disgusting the barbarians are and uh, that kind of uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but Du Fu has a has a sort of interesting twist on this here. Du Fu is attuned to the unpredictable legacies uh, that poetry can have, and it strikes him that um, the pathos of Wang Zhaojun's suffering has actually unexpectedly ended up ensuring that China's barbarian neighbors will have a permanent place in its literary imagination, right? So um, poems and songs about Wang Zhaojun are often set to Central Asian music. And the interest uh, that her, you know, supposedly tragic exile among these disgusting barbarians um, generated amongst Chinese poets and readers and listeners um, has meant that uh, Central Asian barbarian aesthetics have become actually central parts of Chinese culture. So just as uh, Wang Zhaojun left behind a supposedly evergreen grave, that is um, where she was buried in the, in the uh, desert, um, there are kind of like Chinese plants and, and green grasses growing. Um, so just as she left behind kind of a little bit of China in Central Asia, so too has her suffering kind of paradoxically enabled a certain merger between Chinese culture and that of its neighbors. Right, so in all three of these poems, the sufferings and the failures of a Southern luminary have subsequently become significant in a way that that figure themselves could, have, could not have expected. Um, and they've become significant to a community uh, that that figure could not have foreseen or imagined. Um, and uh, given this repeating pattern, it's worth pausing for a moment here to dis to, to think about the title of the series, um, Singing My Feelings on Traces of the Past. Now, commentators have mostly understood the word traces ji, as referring to historical sites, landmarks of the Southlands that supposedly stirred Du Fu's feelings about his own situation. Uh, in this last poem about uh, Wang Zhaojun, the, the site in question is supposedly her home village, which is mentioned um, in the second line here. Uh, but as it turns out, Du Fu wasn't actually anywhere near her home village. She was hundreds of miles away when he wrote this poem. It's not like he visited it and was stirred to think about it. Um, and, and if we go back to poem two, um, this interpretation of, of trace as site is equally problematic because actually the site of the Chu Palace is now uncertain. It, you know, there is no historical trace there anymore. Um, 
And if we go back to poem one, we'll see that this vision of uh, G trace a site doesn't work at all um, because it doesn't mention any sites. So um, I think that this kind of common interpretation of the word G in the title is probably not what Du Fu had in mind, or at least um, it's only kind of a subset of the sort of thing he had in mind. Instead, uh, this word G was actually a central concept in medieval philosophy. Uh, Thinkers in, in you know, the kind of Xuanxue tradition often drew a distinction between the ancient sages themselves and the records of their actions, institutions, and words, that is, between their traces and what made the traces. This distinction was hermeneutically useful insofar as it allowed for claims that it was possible and necessary to adapt the sages' teachings to new times and new problems rather than slavishly imitating what the sages did. So the traces were static, but what made the traces was actually something capable of adapting to circumstance. So I hope you can kind of begin to sense here already how this uh, medieval philosophical concept of traces might be relevant to a series of poems that discusses how legacies can unexpectedly transform over time as circumstances change. Yet Dufu has reversed the common medieval distinction. Now it's the traces that transform rather than the sages that left the traces. In each poem of this series, that which left the traces is simply suffering, exile, and failure, you know, that define the lives of the people Dufu is thinking about. Their traces, however, prove capable of transformation, taking on new sorts of significance over time to new communities. So um, I'm, I'm going a little bit slower than I, I uh, meant to, so I'm gonna actually skip over poem four, um, and I'm gonna just jump to the last one, um, which demonstrates one of the techniques that Dufu developed in his late poetry to render it equal to his hope that his work too might transform into the future. Um, and this technique that Dufu uses um, is uh, systematic ambiguity. Dufu is kind of the poet of ambiguity in the Chinese tradition. Um, so in this final poem of the series about the three kingdoms era uh, minister of Shu, uh, Zhuge Liang, Dufu begins with a line that has become extremely famous. The great name of Zhuge Liang hangs over the Yuzhou. Now, those of you who know uh, Mandarin, I'm sorry, I don't know Cantonese, um, but uh, you know, those of you who know Mandarin know that Yuzhou, uh, which is literally eaves and ridgepole, most frequently means the universe. And every commentator I'm aware of thus takes this line as metaphorical, meaning something like Zhuge Liang is very famous throughout the entire world, which is a, a, a very reasonable reading of this line. But actually, we have to consider what Dufu is writing about here, um, a shrine like the one that you can hopefully kind of make out faintly in the background of this slide. Um, and in that context, Yu Zhou does not have to mean the universe. It can more literally refers, refer to the eaves and the ridgepole of the shrine, just like you see in the background, from which would have hung a plaque with Zhuge Liang's name inscribed on it in huge characters, right? So there is, in other words, both a concrete way and an abstract way to understand this line. And the same thing is true of the second line as well, where the remnant image of Zhuge Liang is both the abstract image of the man that we can form from his deeds, and also more literally, the painting of him that would have conventionally been placed within the shrine. So um, this first couplet is sort of systematically ambiguous. Uh, and what I think is going on here is that Dufu, by encoding these ambiguities into his poetry, um, he's trying to enable his own traces, his poetry, to have something like the transformability he has seen in the traces of the Southern luminaries 
discussed throughout the series. Um, indeed, I, I see him here as trying to tie his own transformation to Zhuge Liang's. So according to Hoyt Tillman, Zhuge Liang was not at Du Fu's time the culture hero he has since come to be. Everybody now knows Zhuge Liang. Um, but at Du Fu's time, he seems to have been something of a kind of regional figure, irregularly paid cult at a few dilapidated shrines in the territory of Old Shu. So what Du Fu is doing in this poem's ambiguities um, is creating a conduit whereby the veneration afforded to Zhuge Liang at this dilapidated regional shrine's lesser Yu Zhou may be transformed into veneration throughout the larger Yu Zhou, throughout the universe. And if Du Fu can convince the whole world that Zhuge Liang was a great man, despite his failure to reunite the empire of his own time, then maybe Du Fu's failed life will likewise have more significance than he can see. All right, so it, it was, I think, techniques like this one that made Du Fu's work so propitious for the new recordizing model that would come along to revolutionize Chinese poetic understanding in the late imperial period. Most of Du Fu's contemporaries were, you know, very understandably writing poetry that made sense to them and to their immediate audiences. What this meant though, was that when what made sense changed, their poetry was not guaranteed to remain potent under the new paradigm. Du Fu, however, was trying to write poetry that would be read by people whose ideas and predilections um, he could not predict. By the end of his life, he was purposefully trying to find ways to write that actually depended on paradigms changing. And so it's not a complete coincidence that when late imperial readers felt unsatisfied by the paradigms of poetic significance they had inherited, um, they were able to consolidate a new paradigm of poetic significance around his work. So in this sense, Du Fu's readers have done with his verse exactly what he hoped they would. Um, and this is true despite the fact that recordizing reading, the idea that the significance of the poem was there in the moment of its composition, um, presents a you know, complete stark contrast to the way that I uh, personally read Du Fu's late verse. Um, yet if I'm at all right, about what Du Fu was thinking uh, in these late poems, then my own interpretation can't be any more final than I personally think that those critics' interpretation is. So Du Fu's poetry is designed to be misread. In fact, that's the only way to read it well. To put the point another way, um, and you know, I hope this will be what we maybe will spend some of our time talking about, um, Du Fu's poetry is designed to be a kind of comparative literature. It's designed to be seen through lenses um, that are not its own. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much.